Chesarani or Chesarani, pronunciation. Uh, David will be speaking today. The title of the lecture is Muslims Are Not Jews, Comparing Islamophobia and Antisemitism in Britain and Europe. Uh, David is a professor of history at Royal Holloway uh, College at the University of London. He oversees the AHRC Fund, uh, which is Jewish Philanthropy and Social Development in Europe. Uh, he's also a, um, he's, he's overseeing the fund, a collaborative doctoral award held with the Jewish Museum to conduct research into involvement in Jews in the entertainment industry in Britain over the past 150 years. He's been an advisor to the Home Office on Holocaust Memorial Day, which I think is connected to your subject today, and is a trustee of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust. Uh, he supervises uh, doctoral students at his college. He's been a member of the British delegation to the International Task Force on Intergovernmental Cooperation on Holocaust Education, Remembrance and Research. He served as, on the advisory board for the Imperial War Museum's Permanent Holocaust Exhibit. Um, and he has an OBE for service to Holocaust education and advising the government with regard to the establishment of the Holocaust Memorial Day. So it's really a tremendous honor to have you here today and, and welcome. Well, it, it's an honor for me to be here. Um, it's always been an ambition of mine to visit Yale University, to uh, lecture, uh, to speak here. Um, and it's a particular privilege to be uh, a speaker in a very distinguished program that uh, Charles Small has organized as part of uh, a very important um, initiative. I don't think I need to really underline uh, the importance of this project to, to this audience. Now, um, in my presentation, I'm going to slightly uh, change the title. I put a question mark, are oh, Muslims the new Jews? Um, because I thought in some ways uh, it was giving too much away, although you may already have uh, figured out how I'm going to answer the question. But for um, the sake of academic pr propriety and, 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 and the games that academics play, um, I'm going to begin, so this is a void of discovery for all of us. And one reason that I'm, I'm grateful to have been invited is that this is not my uh, natural uh, territory. And at Royal Holloway, I'm very lucky to be part of a history department that includes three of Britain's foremost scholars of, of Islamic civilization, Muslim um, society. So I have become increasingly interested in thinking about Jews in comparison to Muslims. This is the first time I've put my mind to thinking about Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. So it was a, a voyage of discovery for me, although uh, perhaps a rather too short of a voyage. Um, and uh, I invite you to uh, join me in search of that question mark. Now, it's become increasingly common in recent years to read or hear hostility towards Muslim Islam compared with antipathy towards Jews and Judaism. What I want to ask today is how valid is this comparison? And is it helpful to understanding either Islamophobia or anti-Semitism to bracket the two? I'm going to start by giving some examples of the way in which people, particularly in Britain but also in Europe, um, have compared and bracketed the two. Um, I'm then going to uh, see whether this uh, comparison uh, stands up on closer e examination. And I'm going to suggest uh, that um, it is uh, an inappropriate uh, comparison um, and possibly even um, a dangerous one. In January 2006, Yasmin Alibay Brown, a journalist for the Independent newspaper, a very well-respected uh, writer uh, who would describe herself as, as a secular uh, Muslim, criticized the Muslim Council of Britain, the MCB, for its decision to boycott Holocaust Memorial Day. It had been boycotting Holocaust Memorial Day, and Charles mentioned that I'm involved with this event, uh, boycotting Holocaust Memorial Day since its inception. Uh, in 2001. Alibi Brown reasoned in her criticism of the Muslim Council of Britain 
The Muslims should participate in the Memorial Day because non-Jews were victims of Nazi persecution and because remembering Nazism, quote, reminds us of how thin is the crust of European civilization so that it can be thrown off by the slightest provocation or none at all. And she had no doubt where the perceived provocation was coming from in our times. She wrote, today the Jews of Europe are Muslims. She said they faced the same kind of hatred that confronted Jews in the 1930s and concluded, by remembering the Holocaust with past victims, we remind ourselves of what could happen in the future. Several months later, um, another uh, respected columnist, India Knight, writing in the Sunday Times, attacked Jack Straw, MP, the leader of the House of Commons, <coughs> after he had said that Muslim women wearing the niqab, the full veil, were, in his words, making a statement of separateness and difference. She wondered if Jack Straw would have dared suggest that nuns divest themselves of their habits, or indeed that Orthodox Jewish women should stop wearing um, scarves or uh, wigs, shrikles. What was the problem with a woman covering her hair, uh, she asked. The lesson she drew from the huge controversy that Jack Straw sparked off uh, with his comment, the lesson she drew was that it's open season on Islam, Muslims, are the new Jews. Soon after this, Ken Livingstone, the world famous or world infamous mayor of London, ruffled feathers when he presented a report on the life of Muslims in the city. He showed that the report showed that they suffered from extensive discrimination in housing and employment. They were more likely to suffer religiously motivated crimes. At the press conference where the report was launched, Livingstone also condemned the way Muslims are portrayed in the media, especially in connection with the war on terror. The entire debate, he said, these are his words, has been lopsided as though somehow it is the Muslims' fault. That echoes Hitler and Goebbels and all the others who said it was the Jews' fault. The president of the Muslim Council of Britain, Dr. Abdul Muhammad Bari, was present at the press conference where this report was presented, and at first he appeared to distance himself from Ken Livingstone's remarks. <coughs> but the following month, when he was addressing a meeting of MPs, uh, Dr. Bari made exactly the same point. He criticised uh, government ministers for, in his words, unfairly targeting Muslims in the context of the War of Terror, and he asked rhetorically, his words, what is the degree of xenophobia that tipped Germany in the 1930s towards a murderous ethnic and cultural racism? When he was asked by journalists to comment on the implicit comparison, Dr. Barry said, we know what happened in Germany and we have to be on guard against entire communities being demonized due to the actions of a minority. A few months later, a similar claim was made by Dr. Mohammed Nassim, the chairman of the Birmingham Central Mosque, one of the largest and oldest mosques in the country, after several Muslims were arrested by the police in Birmingham in connection with an alleged terrorist plot. He told the press that Britain was becoming a police state and compared the police raids to the persecution of the Jews in Nazi Germany. Dr. Bari, the president of the Muslim Council, returned to the 1930s comparison after Jonathan Evans, the head of MI5, the security intelligence agency responsible for anti-terrorism, issued a warning against the dangers of extremism in the Muslim population. Speaking to the Daily Telegraph, uh, Dr. Bari complained about the endless negative depiction of Muslims in the media, and he warned that, his words, every society has to be really careful so the situation doesn't lead us to a time when people's minds can be poisoned as they were in the 1930s. <coughs> Bari's words were reported rather more bluntly on the BBC News. A headline of the BBC proclaimed that the head of the Muslim Council of Britain had warned the UK must avoid becoming like Nazi Germany. Now it should be noted, this was not exactly what Dr. Bari had said and the Muslim Council of Britain issued um, a disclaimer. But whether or not Muslim leaders were directly comparing Britain under Prime Minister Gordon Brown to Germany under Chancellor Adolf Hitler, 
The implication uh, was clear. There was, at the very least, a comparison with Europe in the 1930s, when anti-Semitism was rampant and the foundations were being laid for the Nazi program to annihilate the Jews. And although this comparison has riled Jews and non-Jews alike, and I'm going to spare you all the controversies that these comments arouse and the, the statements of contradiction that came from various quarters, despite all of these uh, counter-statements, the analogy has proved irresistible. It keeps on being made. One of the most recent instances was a press release from the Muslim Public Affairs Committee of the UK on Christmas Day 2007 on its website when it published a report about a fatal attack on an Asian man in Bolton which police suspected was racially motivated. The report was simply headlined, We Are Truly the New Jews. So, that is an example of this comparison that's being made in Britain. Let me now turn to Europe. And I'd like to begin with Gunter Grass. In the wake of the 9-11 attacks, Nobel Prize winning novelist warned that the climate of hostility towards Muslims in Germany threatened to trigger a second Kristallnacht. Indeed, the comparison between Islamophobia and antisemitism and the assertion that they are more or less equivalent has become almost doctrinaire within the European Union and other European intergovernmental organizations responsible for monitoring and combating racism. In early 2002, the European Union, EU, Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia, the EUMC, called on its national focal points, its reporting groups, to report on the year-long upsurge of attacks on Jewish communities across Europe. The data was analyzed and introduced by Werner Bergman and Julian Wetzel of the Center for the Study of Antisemitism, the Technical University of Berlin, a very well-respected institution. Uh, Bergman and Wetzel concluded that the attacks were committed, in their words, above all, either by right-wing extremists or radical Islamists or young Muslims mostly of Arab descent. The report connected the actions of young Muslims to events in the Middle East, particularly the Al-Aqsa Intifada and the Israeli response to it. Bergman and Wetzel concluded that, I quote from their report, which was not published, I'll come to that in a moment, in our opinion, one cannot deny that there exists a close link between the increase of anti-Semitism and the escalation of the Middle East conflict. Whereas factors which usually determine the frequency of anti-Semitic incidents in the respective countries, such as the strength and degree of mobilization of extremist far-right parties and groups can generate, have not played the decisive role in the reporting <coughs> period. However, the EUMC, the Monitoring Commission, declined to publish the report on the grounds that the methodology was suspect. Instead, it commissioned Alexander Pollock, a respected academic of Vienna University, who was also the EUMC manager of research, to provide a critical appraisal of the data. The revised report was finally released in 2004. It stated that contrary to the shift in public perception, this was the wording used, the shift in public perception that the typical perpetrator uh, from the extreme right-wing skinhead type had moved to the perception of a disaffected young Muslim, the country-by-country -country reports, quote, suggest a more complex picture than that, thus differentiating the public perception, which Bergman and Wetzel reported from what was really going on, which Pollock believed was illustrated by a more critical appraisal of the data. And the revised report concluded that while there was a correlation between events in the Middle East and spikes in anti-Jewish activity, due to the unreliability of reporting mechanisms, quote, it is problematic to make general statements with regard to the perpetrators of anti-Semitic acts. Now the alleged suppression of the report and the release of a revised and mildly critical report that commented, as I've just suggested, indicated on the data of the first one, led to uh, a great deal of criticism. Uh, particularly here in America, the ADL uh, 
claimed that the conclusions of the original EU MC report were suppressed because it pointed the finger at the left and at Muslim communities. And this accusation was uncomfortable because the EUMC, a body of the European Union, was heavily invested in the belief that prejudice against Muslims and anti-Jewish feeling are subjects of a generic racism. If anti-Semitism emanated from Muslim quarters, this would suggest it could hardly be identical to Islamophobia. Yet the belief in their equivalence underpinned the European Commission's major project in 2002-2003. This is a project called The Fight Against Antisemitism and Islamophobia, Bringing Communities Together. During one of the roundtable discussions with the vehicle for this initiative, Robert Perkis, the chair of the EU MC Management Board, said, as you can see, our conceptions of European identity are significant drivers of antisemitism and Islamophobia. One of the similarities between antisemitism and Islamophobia is their historical relationship to a Europe perceived as exclusively Christian. Jews have, of course, suffered the most unspeakable crimes by European Christians. But it is true that all other religions, including Judaism and Islam, have been excised from the prevailing understanding of Europe's identity as Christian and white. Both Islam and Judaism have long served as Europe's other as a symbol for a distinct culture and religion and ethnicity. Now, although several contributors at the three roundtable sessions that were convened under the heading of the fight against anti-Semitism and um, Islamophobia, the EUMC representatives presented a united front. This is a statement by Professor Ed Van Thing, a member of the more, another member of the Board of Management, insisting that we have a clear-cut definition of racism in place. We all know that anti-Semitic, but also Islamophobic expressions of racist cultures are subcultures. That's the difference with the pre-war period. In the pre-war period, the Jews were the enemy. Today, there are a number of enemies. We have to fight racism in all its aspects, and there is a mutual interest to fight anti-Semitism, but also Islamophobia together. So you can see how the European's prime body for monitoring racism, anti-Semitism, attacks on Muslim communities, and formulating ways of combating them, is wedded to the idea, in essence, of an equivalence between the two, and they must be fought jointly. In his public pronouncements on anti-Semitism since 2002, the European Union has consistently unfolded anti-Semitism within the more generic categories of racism and xenophobia. On the 15th of June 2006, for example, the European Parliament passed a resolution condemning the increase of racist and xenophobic violence in Europe, which noted inter alia, amongst other things, the rise in anti-Jewish attacks. The resolution also noted recommendations to establish mechanisms to monitor and combat anti-Semitism, but went on to talk, call on member states to launch campaigns to promote cultural diversity, lead the fight against racism and other forms of intolerance. The same conflation is apparent in the statements and initiatives of the Council of Europe acting through the European Commission Against Racism and Intolerance, ECRI. You'll have to forgive all of these acronyms and initials, but it, I've only got 45 minutes and it makes it a bit quicker. In March 2005, ECRI adopted a report on racist, anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic and xenophobic discourse in the political sphere. According to the report, this is a press release from ECRI talking about its own report, which is somehow the easiest way of finding what the report said. According to the report, immigrants and refugees, especially those from Muslim countries, are the primary targets of politicians exploiting feelings of insecurity in an increasingly complex and multicultural world. It goes on, 
Eckley considers this increased use of racist, anti-Semitic, and xenophobic language and ideas in political life to be a worrying development. So there again, you've got an example of how a leading European body packages the two things together. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, consistently packages anti-Semitism uh, in or condemnations of anti-Semitism in with condemnations of racism and xenophobia. Uh, as a result of lobbying by Jewish NGOs, including American organizations, alarmed by the surge in anti-Jewish incidents across Europe, in December 2002, the Council of Ministers of the OSCE passed a resolution, here it is, reaffirming its concern about the manifestations of aggressive nationalism, racism, chauvinism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, and violent, pardon the spelling mistake, extremism, wherever they may occur. And went on to decree uh, a meeting to discuss anti-Semitism explicitly. And to be fair, there have been a number of important meetings convened under the auspices of the OSCE to look specifically at um, anti-Semitism, convening various experts <laughs> together. Although very often the <coughs> resolutions and public statements by the OSCE don't quite reflect this. For example, a second conference dedicated to anti-Semitism led to the so-called Berlin Declaration against all acts motivated by anti-Semitism or other forms of religious or racial hatred and calling on participating states to take requisite counter measures. So although the OSCE and the European uh, Commission have done important work to try and monitor anti-Semitism specifically, to try and understand it, to combat it, very often the public pronouncements uh, use this formula in which anti-Semitism is wrapped in with racism, chauvinism, extreme nationalism, xenophobia, and Islamophobia. But how far does this kind of lumping together stand up to scrutiny? This is what I want to move on to now. In an important critique of the European position, Matty Bunzel, a professor of anthropology and history at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, argues that despite superficial likenesses, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia have discrete historical genealogies and function in very different ways. And I'm very grateful to Matty Bunzel's pamphlet published by Prickly Paradigm Press of Chicago, wonderful little outfit, because he's kind of made my job a lot easier today. On the one hand, he's presented what, what I think is a very cogent critique of the equivalence of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. At the same time, he's made a whole series of what I consider to be fundamental errors, which allow me to take his analysis further a little bit and to suggest that his needs some readjustment. He argues that, and I agree with him completely, anti-Semitism has far older antecedents than antagonism to Islam. For nearly two millennia, of course, Jews have had a central place in Europe's Christian culture in a way that Muslims never did. Moreover, I think he's quite right that anti-Semitism took its most virulent form under very specific conditions in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century as part of the reaction against <coughs> modernity, a phase that culminated in the genocidal fantasy of creating racially pure nation states. We'll see how to bundle this is a defining uh, moment in the history of anti-Semitism, or classic anti-Semitism. By contrast, he maintains that Islamophobia emerged quite recently, and I'll have more to say about that in a moment. But let's continue with what Bunzel has to say about anti-Semitism. <clears throat> Turning to the current situation, he rejects both the alarmist's uh, point of view, those who detect a new anti-Semitism, and the point of view of the deniers, those who came down the manifestation of hostility towards the Jews, claim that... Uh, 
there is nothing particularly new. He acknowledges that there is something very nasty uh, going on uh, at the moment, particularly in the guise of anti-Zionism, in, in sections of the left and in the anti-globalization movement, and within some sections of certain Muslim communities. But he argues, and this is where I really do begin to differ from him, he argues that the conditions that made anti-Semitism so pervasive and so lethal have gone. Religion, he argues, was at the core of classic anti-Semitism. Europe is now secular. Classic anti-Semitism was a feature of extreme nationalism, the creation of racially, ethnically pure states. But the nation state has had its day, he argues. And he points out, and, and this is, I think, important and interesting, he points out that even far-right parties in Europe have abandoned classic, old-fashioned anti-Semitism. The Front National in France, the Vlaams Bloc in Belgium, the Austrian Freedom Party, have not only disavowed Nazi ideology, they actually caught Jewish voters. The main target of these far-right parties is now Europe's Muslim populations, which of course is the basis on which the far right is courting Jewish voters because Jewish voters, Jewish people, share an anxiety about the Muslim presence, rightly or wrongly. Bunzel asserts, whereas traditional anti-Semitism has run its historical course with a supersession of the nation state, Islamophobia, is rapidly emerging as a defining condition of the new Europe. So, to Bunzel, just to summarize, one reason why Islamophobia and anti Semitism are incomparable is that there's not really any more anti Semitism to speak of, whereas there's a hell of a lot of anti Islamophobia, and it's serious. It's institutionalized, it's forms the plank of political parties in a way that is not the case with anti-Semitism. Banzo identifies an unprecedented shift in antipathy. Contemporary anti-Semitism such as it is, he argues, has a very different function and meaning to traditional, to traditional forms of Jew hatred. This is an interesting point. Historically, anti-Semitism was associated with the far right which attack Jews, as I've said, in order to purify the nation of alien elements. But when young Muslims attack Jews verbally or physically, they don't aspire to purify the nation of alien elements. Their agenda is completely different. They assail Jews because of events in the Middle East, and because they feel excluded from European society, the privileges of which seem to them to be embodied by the Jews. On the other hand, Muslims have replaced Jews as the prime enemy of the far right and even some centre-right parties. <coughs> Jews today are valued Europeans. Many uh, European political leaders speak about Jews as uh, the archetypal Europeans, the oldest, the best Europeans, whereas Muslims are the target of immigration controls and security measures. And, of course, one of the main defining features for many European politicians is the exclusion of Europe, of, of Turkey, from EU membership. So let me, again, summarize this section. Europeans of all political stripes debate the loyalty, the assimilability of Muslims, whether they can be good Europeans, in a way that was once the case for Jews, but is now utterly unthinkable. Indeed, the protection of Jews and the memorialization of the Holocaust have become defining features of the European unity, of the European Union and European identity, whereas the blandishments against Muslims and their social exclusion has become, in a way, another badge of Europe. Another very important suggestion why Islamophobia and anti-Semitism should be separated out. As I said, I think there's much of value in Bunzel's differentiation of these two hatreds. 
But I think that his analysis is flawed. Flawed in three important respects. First, he misconstrues the historical origins and the variations of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Second, he underplays the difference between responses to accurate perceptions of menace as against reaction to fantasies of a threat. And third, he substantially distorts the current state of relations between faiths and ethnicities in Europe, hence his ability to downplay anti-Semitism, and I would argue to exaggerate Islamophobia. Bunzel is right that anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are incomparable, and the comparison is unhelpful. He's right for the wrong reasons, and his conclusions are not only erroneous, I think they're actually rather dangerous. Let me explain why. And I'll start with that rather extraordinary statement that Islamophobia um, emerged quite recently. He writes, it is a phenomenon of the late 20th and the early 21st centuries. I think this is an extraordinary, I can see a head shaking. This is an extraordinary uh, statement. Islam has been Europe's other since the 8th century. I don't need to go into the odes celebrating the turning back of Muslim armies in the 8th century, the Song of Roland, of where Dante places Muhammad in hell, the Crusades, medieval romances, the way in which Renaissance writers dealt with Islam, nor the way in which writers in the 17th and 18th centuries discussed Islam, Muslims, the East, nor the Orientalist writers, uh, the contribution of poets, uh, authors such as Byron, Coleridge, Disraeli. I'm sure the way in which they explored the Muslim East in fact and fantasy is, is familiar uh, to you. And, and although um, I think we probably all now um, understand that Edward Said's analysis of Orientalism was uh, 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 not only uh, completely uh, misjudged um, and um, ill-informed, but malevolent in spirit, does not mean that the texts that he assembled provide a very useful uh, collection of uh, documents of how Europeans thought and wrote about the East, the Orient, albeit at a specific time. So, there has been writing, thinking, about Muslims, Islam, the East, for many, many centuries. What is different about the way in which Islam um, has been depicted, and the way in which Jews have been depicted over not an equally long period, a thousand more years of misunderstanding and uh, deliberate distortion in the case of the Jews, one fundamental difference is that the depiction of Islam, the characterization of Muslims, was generated in the context of power relations between East and West, Christendom, and uh, the Muslim worlds. Edward Said focused on the periods when Muslim societies were economically prostrate, when they were militarily weak, vulnerable to penetration by European interests that eventually led to invasion and colonial domination. But over the previous centuries, the boot had been on the other foot. Europeans were afraid of Muslim imperialism, colonialism, and conversion. The great scholar of uh, Islam and Muslim societies, Fred Halliday, writes, with the Ottoman advances of the 15th and 16th centuries, a further chapter of anti-Muslimism, on top of that written during the Crusades, was written. One can indeed suggest that it was this experience, above all, which shaped European attitudes. Now, of course, European states also traded with Muslim powers. They enjoyed diplomatic relations with them, even during the period of Ottoman advances, when, Europe's went in, when Europeans went in fear of uh, Muslim powers. The irony of that is that uh, Muslim, uh, Europeans looked on the uh, societies of the Muslim world um, with respect and with awe. 
uh, their cities seem more beautiful, more cosmopolitan, more efficient than the European counterparts. And for much of the 17th and 18th centuries, when Europe was being torn apart by religious wars, civil strife, Muslim civilization, enviously stable and tolerant. In other words, the depiction of Muslims and of Islam took place within a very different power relationship to that prevailing at a time when Europeans wrote, thought about, depicted Jews. I don't need to go into any further detail. I think I would just mention one book that I found particularly illuminating in this respect, and that is Linda Colley's book, Captives, Britain Empire in the World, 1600 to 1850. I mention this book partly because Linda Colley taught me when I was at Cambridge. I'm very glad to see Paul Hyman, who taught me while I was at Columbia a couple of years after that. But also because Linda Colley held a chair here in this uh, university, and Paul Hyman holds a chair here now. So I just want to mention Linda Colley's book, Captives, because it's part of the book is a, is a wonderful exploration of the captive narratives that were written by Europeans who came back from um, mainly North Africa, having been captured by so-called Barbary pirates in the 17th and 18th centuries. These captive narratives were extremely <laughs> popular. They were rather like slave narratives in North America in the uh, middle of the 19th century. They were very widely read. They had a tremendous impact. <clears throat> and what they do, partly, is speak of the vulnerability of Europeans in the face of Islam and Muslim power. Uh, the uh, awesome power, the strength of Muslim societies, their military strength, and also the lure of their culture and civilizations. Many captives converted or attempted to convert. This leads me to two very important points. First of all, that of course Said is completely wrong in arguing, claiming that Orientalism, the depiction of Islam and the East, was generated purely in a period of European uh, imperialism and dominance over Islamic societies. Um, he's wrong about that. Uh, he's also, uh, but also that European popular culture was pervaded with stereotypes of fear of Islam, of Muslims being a source of terror. Linda Colley writes that by the late 18th century, North African Islamic society stood for tyranny, brutality, poverty, and loss of freedom. So, whereas in classic, the classic taxonomies of Orientalism, created by Ibn Said and his many followers, depicts Islam as always subservient, weak, decadent, eroticized, there were several centuries of a very different version of Islam, as militant, aggressive, imperialistic, powerful, strong, efficient, <coughs> cosmopolitan, sophisticated, and indeed characterized by high culture of enormous achievements. Why this discourse, this diversion into Orientalism? Because so much of the analysis of Islamophobia is rooted in the Saidian understanding of Orientalism, particularly that of Matty Bunzel. And this is one of the most fundamental points at which he goes off the rails. He is utterly mistaken to reduce Islamophobia to a function of modernity and to depict it as a feature purely of efforts to define a united Europe. Many of the features of Islamophobia that he identifies as European are to be, fact, to be found, for example, here in, in the USA. And the relationship between European and Islamic societies has been ongoing for centuries. Over this long span, it wasn't solely mediated by Orientalism. Indeed, I think it's beginning to seem as though the period charted by Edward Said appears more of an aberration than the norm. And I, I ask, is it 
too fanciful to suggest that the renewed confrontation with armed Muslims, I don't mean all Muslims, a section of militant, armed, Islamic communities, that this confrontation evokes at some level the terror of the Ottomans and the Barbary pirates. Is it too far-fetched to suggest that the taking of hostages in Tehran, Lebanon, Iraq, Palestine, Iran, echoed the hostage taking by Muslims of previous eras? The folk memory of capture and ransom has been kept alive in films like Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and most young people, certainly in Europe, grow up on Bourgest and, and Kipling. But these images, these notions of a powerful Islam and vulnerable Europeans, I think is, is, is kept alive. If attitudes towards Islam may be inflected by history, popular memory, and media stereotypes, what is the effect of more recent events? Let me quote Fred Halliday again. Fred Halliday's comprehensively dismantled the notion of an Islamic threat to the West. But he willingly concedes that just because the menace of the monolithic Islam is grotesquely exaggerated, doesn't mean that some Islamists do not wish harm to those they perceive as enemies, including, of course, other Muslims. A cadre of militants does subscribe to the claims made against them. They do claim the existence of a united monolithic Muslim world. They do seek to supplant Christianity and Judaism with Islam. They do dismiss the West as corrupt. They do attack secularism and democracy. In that sense, Fred Halliday writes, we are, and I quote his words, in purely ideological terms, faced with a phenomenon that is quite unlike those other stereotypical hostilities, anti-communism and anti-Semitism. Let me conclude this phase of my paper then. Islamophobia is incommensurable with anti-Semitism because Jews, as Jews, never espouse the attitudes ascribed to them by anti-Semites, unlike a certain small section of Islamists who are only too happy to take ownership of the claims, accusations made against them. Jews never threatened any state or society as Jews or in the name of Judaism. There's no equivalent of the Ottoman Empire in Jewish history. There are no Jewish Barbary pirates capturing and enslaving or terrorizing Europeans. Islamophobia may be an inappropriate, unreasonable, and indeed a provocative reaction to a grossly inflated threat. But the danger of terrorism by Islamists is real, there are several conflicts in the world in which Islamic militants are at war in the name of Islam. Nothing can justify lumping all Muslims together, let alone blaming them all for the actions of a tiny minority that follow certain beliefs derived from particular interpretations of Islam. But denying the grounds for fear of Islam does not equate it with completely groundless anti-Semitism. I want to uh, uh, move on to uh, look at Bunzel's claim that Muslims face more peril than Jews do. And I'm going to have to accelerate now, so I'm going to make more use of the uh, screen and the statistics on it. There's no doubt that there is a mass of polling data that indicates that uh, there is hostility uh, to Muslims in various guises and under many headings. One of the most important, impressive collisions of this data for the UK, covering the years 1988 to 2006, is by Clive Marks, uh, sorry, Clive Field. I reference it at the top there because if you want to follow it up, if you're interested in this sort of thing, it really is an extraordinary uh, collection of uh, data. Field has revealed that there appears to be an increasing perception that Muslims in Britain are slow to integrate into mainstream society, feel only a qualified sense of patriotism, and are prone to espouse anti-Western values that lead many to condone so-called Islamic terrorism. Uh, just 
look at some of the uh, headlines. 2003, 75% of old Britain saw Islam as a significant threat. 2005, 46% saw them as a threat to democracy. 20% uh, only had negative views of Islam, but 60% favour security measures being focused on Muslims. 80% backed the deportation of foreign imams who expressed sympathy with uh, terrorism. Moving on to 2006, and I don't need to... <coughs> We haven't got time to speak about the background, the different things that occurred, 9-11, uh, uh, invasion of Afghanistan, uh, uh, the uh, Second Iraq War, the bombings in Madrid and in London. The cumulative effect of all of these events was to ratchet up the degree of antipathy uh, anxiety felt by British people towards Muslims. And until you get to these quite extraordinary figures, 70% believe that Muslims need to do more to integrate. <laughs> and ironically, given these statistics, 51% of British saw Muslims as intolerant. Uh, perhaps it's a case of the pop calling the kettle black. <laughs> but the statistics are pretty impressive. And I would say pretty alarming. And I don't want to give the impression, I don't want to allow anyone to walk out of this room thinking that I believe Islamophobia does not exist and that it is insignificant. I found Clive Field's statistics absolutely chilling. And I would not want to be a Muslim in Britain today. Some of you may know that there is a historical echo in what I have just said, but I'm not going to go into it, particularly not in this context. However, however, Field observes that Islamic views in Britain would appear easily to outstrip anti-Semitic sentiments in terms of frequency, more than double the size of the hardcore intensity and overtness. So Field argues that Islamophobia is bad and it's a lot worse than anti-Semitism. Is it? Is it? Does what Field has uh, got to say, on the basis of much less exhaustive research, I should say, because studying anti-Semitism is not his thing, are we justified in seeing Islamophobia as much more serious? Well, if we move on to another EUMC survey, we discover something quite extraordinary. This is the country-by-country country analysis by the EUMC into manifestations of Islamophobia in the European Union after 9-11. I find this equally extraordinary. I'll highlight some of the things that I find most interesting. Austria, violent physical tracks, very, very rare. Finland, few identifiable changes in acts of aggression. France, a rise in every tension. Germany, physical attacks quite rare. Greece, no direct physical or personal verbal attacks. National feelings split equally between anti-Americanism and anti-Muslim attitudes. Ireland, little reaction to the events of September 11. <laughs> Italy, a lack of any reprisals against Muslims. Netherlands, verbal abuse, hostile treatment were the most prevalent. Portugal, the overall picture was one of reconciliation between Muslims uh, and non-Muslims. Spain, no incidents. Sweden, some violent incidents. The UK, a significant rise in attacks on Muslims. Now, just at the moment when emotions are running the highest, and you would most expect an outburst of pogrom, pogrom like rage of the kind predicted by Gunter Grass, there were, in the words of the EUMC report, quote, relatively little, relatively low levels of physical violence across Europe. And indeed, where the violence did occur, notably in the Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, and the UK, it tended to strike at all visible ethnic minorities and to be an accentuation of pre existing xenophobia, anti asylum seeker feelings specifically. 
So extraordinarily enough, 9-11 didn't seem to have the effect that you would have expected on Islamophobia. Now, the, the report does point to rise instances of arson, attacks on buildings and sacred places, and above all, a torrent of negative, frequently stereotypical comment in the media. But this literally failed to catch fire. And across Europe, hardly any frontline politicians said a word against Islam. The only exception to that was the notoriously untactful, uh, then Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi, who famously said that Western culture is superior to Muslim culture, although very soon afterwards he was backtracking and apologizing. What actually happened after 9-11 was that, yes, governments put in place many tough security measures that targeted Muslim populations, but they also put in into place a huge range of measures to protect Muslim populations. In Britain, this culminated in the passage of the Racial and Religious Hatred Act 2006, a law to criminalize the incitement to hatred on the grounds of religious belief, specifically intended to plug a gap in the race relations legislation. A bill that had to be forced through Parliament in the teeth of bitter opposition from a wide coalition of groups. I don't need to say anything in this place or before this audience about what was happening contemporaneously in the case of anti-Jewish feeling. I'm sure you've heard enough. My friend, colleague Shlomo Lapin was here some time ago talking about events in Britain. <coughs> Familiar with the spikes of anti-Semitism in relation to attacks in the Middle East, the nature of these anti-Semitic manifestations across Europe. And I should just mention the last report by the Community Security Trust in Britain for 2007 showed that although there had been a fall off in anti-Jewish attacks, they were still the highest they've been since 1989. And worryingly, in 2007, there, was, there were no triggers. There was nothing going on in the Middle East to have caused a spike. It appears as though these levels of anti-Semitism have settled. So it would appear that anti-Jewish sentiment has intensified dramatically since 2000. Evidence that I think surely should raise a question mark against Matthew Bunzel's assertion about its insignificance at the current time. It may be his contention that Islamophobia differs from anti-Semitism chiefly because Islamophobia is political, institutionalized, and central to European identity, which may be true. But the data that you're familiar with on anti-Semitism, rather than confirming the normalization of the Jewish presence in Europe, I would suggest, indicates a normalization of Jew hatred and acceptance, mainly because of Zionism and Israel, this is what Jews must expect to live with. Let me now conclude with a few rather random um, thoughts. Let me just make sure there's something else here. Ah, yes, I'm going to come to this and I'm going to end on this. A few rather random thoughts about why the comparison between Jews and Muslims, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, while it may seem superficially seductive, is inept and possibly even um, dangerous. A colleague of mine, Malia Malik, a leading academic human rights lawyer, has observed but in Britain between the 1880s and the 1930s, it was the Jews who were regarded as the self-segregated adherents of an obscurantist, narrow, and intolerant faith. East European Jewish immigrants <coughs> in Britain, of course in France, were regarded as a threat to the country's morals, health, political safety. You hear the same thing said about Jews in the Lower East Side of New York. Russian Jews in particular at this time were associated with anarchist terrorism, political subversion. And during the 1930s, large numbers of young Jews in Europe and the US were drawn to the Communist Party, thus arousing the rule for the far right. Malia Malik, surveying this well-known history, concludes that there are recurring patterns in British society, 
was wrote specifically about Britain, that racialized Jews and Muslims, which we need to understand if we are to develop an effective strategy for national security. In, in other words, dealing with the threat of, of, of terrorism for Muslim communities must be undertaken in the light of uh, anti-Semitism um, and the Jewish experience during the 1900s and the 1930s. Now, of course, it's correct that Jewish immigrants were drawn into trade union activity in the late 19th century. Many remained stalwarts of the labor movement well after the Second World War. It's true that Jews were involved with the uh, Bolshevik Party uh, and in communist movements which fueled vicious anti-Semitism on the uh, far right. Many other Jews, of course, rebelled against anti-Semitism by going into uh, the Zionist movement. But these responses to anti-Semitism had many positive consequences, quite unlike the radicalization and Islamicization of Muslim youth. Precisely because Jews reacted against prejudice on the right, they moved to the left, where they found allies. Because National Socialism was anti-Semitic, anti-fascists were doctrinally opposed to anti-Semitism. Participation in international socialist anti-fascist organizations connected Jews with vast collectivities. The key to this process of inclusion was adherence to a secular ideology. Even Zionism was not simply a form of separatism. Uh, Left-wing, right-wing Jews were able to make calls with people on the left and the right on the basis of a shared political orientation. Emigrants went to Palestine, simply moved country. They didn't cut themselves off from the world. One of the most graphic expressions of this rebellion against anti-Semitism and fascism was Jewish participation in the international brigades in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. Contrast that to the trajectory of angry, alienated young Muslims who have traveled to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iraq to train for jihad, to fight the West. They have connected with the Ummah, the Muslim people, but they've severed ties with the rest of society. Their rebellion has taken them into a kind of global ghetto. Their isolation is assuaged only by the fantasy of the caliphate and the conversion of mankind to Islam. Now, you may think that is no more a fantasy than the, the dream of world revolution, an international fraternity once cherished by Jewish radicals. Be that as it may, for a key period, the aspirations of Jewish socialism had tangible and benign consequences. They connected uh, the uh, you know, politically bipolar world, Jewish leftism connected Jews with uh, allies on the left with uh, the wider society. Now there have been attempts in Europe, particularly in Britain, to create a politics that in a sense imitates this, that unites Muslims with the political mainstream. The most successful of these has been the Respect Party in Britain. It grew, up, grew out of the Stop the War movement, which was mainly a uh, coalition of Muslim organizations, pro-Palestinian groups on the far left. The Socialist Workers' Party provided the core, and precisely because of that it's now fallen apart. The Socialist Workers' Party don't want to lead a party that's identified as Muslim. And its main champion, the MP George Galloway, uh, doesn't want to be part of a party that's led by the Socialist Workers. So it's, it's now fallen apart. And the fate of that party, I think, exemplifies the difference between the Jewish and the Muslim experiences. And now finally, because I've gone way over time and you're exhausted and some of you may want to ask a few questions, one last point. Muslims definitely do experience poverty, social exclusion and disempowerment in Europe in a way that Jewish immigrants once did. The Jewish immigrants have no home, had no homeland, they were never associated with powerful sovereign entity. Muslims act in the shadow of Iran, Pakistan, major powers, nuclear armed powers. The protest against the cartoons in Denmark was taken by Muslims from Denmark to other Muslim countries and turned into an international incident. 
achieving something that Jews could never have done uh, in the era of Jewish dispersion, certainly before 1948, the creation of the State of Israel, possibly even since then. Finally, many Muslims, perhaps the majority of them, don't want to be like Jews. And I think these statistics illustrate why. Throughout Europe, Jews are held up as a model of an integrated ethnic faith group, but the polls indicate that a significant proportion of Muslims are unwilling to make the kind of adaptations that Jews have made over the years. Some of you who have visited Britain, who know Britain, will know that every Shabbos, every Shabbat, on the Sabbath, in synagogues, a prayer is said for the royal family. When I was bar mitzvah, there was a toast to the queen, and everybody sang, God save the queen, and then Hatikva. And I'm glad to say they got rid of Hatikva and God save the queen, but we still say a prayer to the rather truncated royal family, but nevertheless the kind of essential members of it. Now compare this attitude of Muslims uh, today. 10% uh, of Muslims think integration has gone too far. I'm probably in the solidification of what too far means. 30% think things are just right. 50% want Muslim schools, like the Jewish school that I send my kids to, but 30% of them don't want to live next door to a non-Muslim. Not quite sure how many Jews would say that about non-Jews. 25% of them don't identify with the British flag. 47% would further live in an Islamic society, 6% etc., etc., etc. This is an extraordinary and dramatic contrast to Jewish attitudes towards being British, towards being Britain. And I think that encouraging Muslims to follow the Jewish path is rather like playing good cop, bad cop. The Jew may be the good cop, as against hardline secularists and advocates of complete assimilation, but is still a cop. So Muslims are not the new Jews. Islamophobia is quite distinct from anti-Semitism. Both are at historically high levels in Europe. And again, please don't misunderstand me. Muslims face a terrible situation in Britain and Europe today. But to cope with these extraordinary levels of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia requires quite separate strategies tailored to the specific histories and the context relevant to each, to do otherwise, I think, would be to court disaster. Thank you very much. So we have some time for Q&A. So, what seems to be the clincher for me is the fact that so much contemporary anti-Semitism does in fact emanate from the Muslim community here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that seems very clear in almost any source of data one would go to. And you don't see the reverse flow. That plus the fact, the, the numbers wouldn't even allow. What's the total number of Jews in Europe? 1.8 oh, million. Right. Total number of Muslims? 58 million. Hey, well, it's larger than that, I think. No, it's generally accepted to be 18. Well, the point is, in, in, in terms of our, in terms of the, the, the balance, it's it's pretty clear. You, you, if there was a huge surge of hostility among Jews towards Muslims, it would it would probably not even register relative to okay. what's coming. But how many? Just guess them. How many Jews do you think believe that yes. the invasion of Iraq was a good idea? Uh, probably less than half. By by a lot. Well, maybe. In this country. Maybe in America. In Europe? In Europe, I think you'd find that probably 80 to 90 percent of Jews thought that the invasion of Iraq was a good thing. You said 80 to I mean, I haven't got the figures, and no one has done any real polling. No one would like to find out. I suspect that you wouldn't find outright expressions of hostility to Muslims. Jews are far too canny when asked questions and opinion polls to say anything that dumb. But if asked whether it's a good idea to invade Muslim countries, yes. A good idea to stop them having nuclear weapons, yes. A good thing to focus security measures on them, definitely, etc., etc., etc. Their views would be 
more extreme the views of the average Brit who I showed you there. I mean, just imagine, those statistics that Clive Field collected were average, the average Brit. If you take a Jewish community of Poland exclusively, I am sure all of those figures would have been increased quite dramatically. So there is hostility amongst Jews to Muslims, but it's of a different order. Right, that's, that's what my point. If, if, if the question, if, if you sort of were to re do the following thought experiment, you remove the Jews from Europe, mm. what's the change going to be in discrimination that Muslims feel among the, coming from the outside? If you remove Muslims from Europe, what would be the change in discrimination towards Jews that Jews would feel? That, that's the point I'm trying to make. It's, it's, it's right. very much a one-way flow like, on that. Well, the just let me deal with that point finally, that's gentlemen, that the European Union position would be that if you took away, you took the Jews away from Europe, if they all did what Ariel Sharon said they should do in 2003 and they all made Aliyah, there would still be hundreds of thousands of disaffected young Muslims who would be burning down schools, destroying police cars, getting upset, joining terrorist organizations, because they're not doing this solely because of Israel, the Middle East, and Jews. Now that, that is a, one of the fundamental points of difference between myself and, and Mani Bunzel and, and, and others. Um, there is a great debate, and Professor Heimer will know this, in, in, in France, about the extent to which the, up, the uprisings of Muslim youth uh, over the last few years in, in the suburbs, Paris and other cities, was a kind of an intifada, or it was anti-Jewish or anti-Zionist, whether these just disaffected young, young, young Muslims. I, I think attitudes towards Israel, the Middle East, to Jews, is absolutely fundamental. I mean, we all know about the young Ilan Khalami, the kid who was, who was kidnapped by Muslims and, and murdered in France, I think it was 2005. They didn't kidnap anybody, they kidnapped a, North, a Jew of North African defense. It seems descent. So I think that the Middle East, Zionism, Israel, the Jews are in that mixture. And I think the EU is absolutely wrong to pretend otherwise, which it likes to do. But having said that, I do think that the degree of social exclusion and prejudice against Muslims and their sense of being fed up and, and that the dark propaganda they are being fed all the time and the stuff they're getting from satellite TV would still be enough to create an enormous amount of turbulence within Muslim communities in European countries. So um, I'm kind of somewhere in between the two. The gentleman at the back, and then the lady here. Okay, um, you put up two sets of numbers um, that, that interested me. One were the numbers from Clive Field, which you called. Um, Chilling. And then at the very end, you had another set of numbers which were describing attitudes in the Muslim community. Yeah. And you sort of treated them as, as unrelated. What I'm thinking is if you accept the second set of numbers as true in the Muslim community, that 86% would only fight to defend Muslim interests, and that 30% um, want to live under Sharia, and 47% would prefer to live in an Islamic country, then the second set, then the, the set of numbers that Clyde Field is calling Islamophobia, I think become more understandable because the question yeah. is, what is the logical progressive yeah. response to a group of people that don't want to be integrated into the country? Wouldn't one of those things be to believe they should do more to want to be integrated? And if you put the word some in rather than all Muslims, then I think a lot of the, and polls obviously are a very imprecise measure, if you, if you take the word sum and put it in there, a lot of those are very defensible um, positions. It seems to me that if you're going to be talking about Islamophobia, you need a better operationalization of the concept. Um, you need to be able to say, well, what represents a reasonable response to the attitudes that are present in the Muslim community and what represents bigotry? And that some, some of that in those numbers seems to be bigotry. Some of it seems not to be. And I don't see in the concept of Islamophobia, the way I hear it being advanced, a very clear differentiation uh, between the two. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Okay, well, I think you're making two separate, unrelated 
both very interesting points. First of all, the, the data, the second set of figures, also comes from Clyde Field, mm -hmm. and he is astute enough to have made exactly the point that you've made, which is that G, if this is what Muslims think, then it's kind of no surprise that the average Brit on the street is worried. And Clive Field is coming at this from a very kind of sympathetic point of view. And that is one reason why the British government, the government throughout Europe, have been able to put in place extremely harsh security and police measures and measures pushing in the direction of what we could call forced integration without there being a great outcome. <coughs> because the Muslim communities have been almost entirely isolated. There are a few human rights, civil rights lawyers, a few cadres on the left who will speak out for Muslims. But by and large, they are out there on their own, which is why I said it, it's no fun to be Muslim um, anymore. Governments read those statistics and they think, we're certainly not going to lose votes getting tough on Muslims, except in those areas where there are large Muslim electorates which is significant, but only for a relatively small number of MPs. So you're quite right. The second point, what is the difference between bigotry and a kind of reasonable dislike or fear of Muslims? Which is rather like saying that the definition of anti-Semitism is disliking Jews more than is necessary or, yeah. Well, you know, I didn't get into the definitions of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, partly because I find that it's a pretty sterile discussion. And also because it always gives me a headache, because it is fearsomely complicated. Is Islamophobia a form of racism? Well, quite a lot of hatred of Islam doesn't differentiate between adherents of Islam who are white and those who are black or brown or whatever. Uh, whereas there is quite a lot of dislike of Islam that is principled from secular humanists and liberals who don't like the precepts of Islam, who would go to the stake to defend people of other ethnicity. Frankly, I'm, I, you know, if we wanted to spend several very dull hours here, we could probably come together on some definition of Islamophobia and some definition of anti-Semitism, but really we've all got better things to do with our time. And you know, it's a case of, you know, in, in, you know, what is a duck? Well, if it waddles and quacks, and it's probably a duck. I and mean, what we've seen there is, you know, it's probably Islamophobia and, and anti-Semitism. You know, what's the difference between bigotry and reasonable prejudices? If it's uh, just all or some Muslims? If, if, if the kind of these statements are made against all Muslims? <clears throat> the problem is that all Muslims are going to believe more or less in some or most or the tenets of, of, of Islam. And you've got people out there, like Chris Hitchens, who hates all religions, and was in Islam in particular, I would say at the moment. Now, can you hate Islam and not be Islamophobic? It's principle, it's not bigoted. He's probably read the Quran once or twice, a few copies, and made up his mind about it. Does that make for an informed judgment? Or is it bigotry? I don't know. The problem with antipathy towards people on the basis of their religious beliefs is that, you know, either you say, well, if you're a reformed Muslim, you're okay, but what right is it to tell someone what degree of Jewishness or Islam is acceptable. We Jews, those of us in this room who are Jewish, I don't, know, I don't know if you all are or just some, but we've been through this dilemma in our history ourselves. And, and what makes dealing with Islamophobia, I think, particularly uncomfortable for many Jewish people, is the demands for integration, the demands for adaptation, and precisely the kind of things that were said to our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and we now wouldn't put up with that kind of stuff, so why should we think it's okay for Muslims? We would regard the argument that you can wear the veil, the hijab, and not the niqab, as being none of you know, no one's business. You know, if our Jewish grandmothers wanted to wear the shaykh or just a scarf, fine! What right has someone now 
got to say, you can have the scarf, but not the shaitl. A tichl, but only a certain size. And that is what is being said to Muslims. Now, is that reason, or is that bigotry? <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry, you had lady first. Just quickly, I was, I was just going to say that I think you're right. If you look at what people are, if you try to get to what they think or what they believe, it's a very dangerous path. I think you can look at actions. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of those numbers that came up may be a mixture of thinking about what religion is, but they're also a response to actions. And I would argue that regardless of how Jews have felt, what they have sought to do is to integrate. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe you could say arguing for a more liberal society because meant to change the society, but they have generally, as you said, they, you know, God saved the queen, they, they have sought to integrate. These are large groups of people who have significant vocal numbers who don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And look at the Archbishop of Canterbury mm -hmm. debate. It's not, your points about the police refer to violent Islam, radical Islam. They don't refer to non-violent, radical Islam, which I think is a bigger danger. And if, I know from talking to your average American here, the very thought that we could be like the UK and have departments that would agree to pay social benefits to polygamous arrangements, that makes people explode. So I would say that there really is a very big problem, and I see those numbers as a kind of an amorphous, don't know what it is, but I don't like the way it is, and it sure bothers me, response. And I would say that that's not really prejudice. And I would also finish my old time chart by saying, if you look at the numbers of voting for Sarkozy, when people were given a chance to pick a mainstream candidate who at least expressed in public the fact that he thought there was some kind of problem as opposed to everybody else refusing, no political, very few political leaders even acknowledging this problem for years. That's where you got the Le Pen numbers. Those are people I said, well, and nobody else is going to say this is a problem. So it's very hard, I think, for any public opinion polling to capture that mm -hmm. because it hasn't been aerated. What was in Sarkozy, the Minister of Interior, he was yeah. leading yes. a show against uh, the U.S. That's right. affairs at the same time. So but he's the only the mainstream rabble. politician who said, look, we got a problem. Instead of, oh no, we don't have a problem. Which is what, when I lived in Europe a number of years ago, mm. there was any politician who suggested that there was a problem with these, these unassimilated immigrants with very different goals mm. was a racist of the far right and was cast out of darkness. Mm. Right. Well, is, have you got a related point to make to that one? Or? Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 yes, please. Um, I'm really troubled by the fact that I view the Islamophobia very uh, focused on the Middle East. Uh, and when you say that uh, people in Europe would say, Jews in Europe would say, yes, go ahead, they not, they avoid the thing about Israel. That's why they fought in the draft. That's probably why they won in Iran, uh, attack in Iran. Uh, and the British are very concerned about immigration from Pakistan and India. Maybe elsewhere. Uh, so it's very localized then. You, you're not talking about the, the Muslims in Indonesia, mm -hmm. the Muslims in India, and the Muslims in Malaysia, and so on, who are not localized in the same way. I mean, I know there are some elements in Indonesia as well, so in general, it's not the same situation. So I think you're putting, you're, you're generalizing about Islamophobia unduly, in my opinion. The second point I'd make is a half a point. If there were a willingness to work together, even though they are different, to fight, to fight bias against Muslims against Jews, I'd like them. What's wrong with that? Uh, it won't happen. But you seem to be saying it, it, it shouldn't happen. Well, th there are huge efforts being made in Europe, particularly by intergovernmental government organizations, to engineer a common fight but it can only be done by deliberately obscuring the anti-Semitism that emanates from certain sections of certain Muslim populations. That's why it is so dangerous. It has, it has to be premised on an act of denial and a complete rejigging of history. It, it has to be premised on the idea that Muslims are weak, powerless, and defenseless, 
despite the fact that you have Pakistan and Iran, a major regional superpowers, one of them armed with nuclear weapons, and have always been weak and powerless and stereotyped relentlessly in the media, which is what the Oriental, the critic of Orientalism has, has told people. And practically every single study on an Islamophobia that you look at in Britain begins by reciting the stereotyping of Islam identified by Said and his followers. It's, it's, it's almost impossible. And this touches on what the lady here was saying. It's almost impossible to get people to think that there may be a fear of Muslims and Islam, no matter how exaggerated and wrongly generalized, because it, it reflects a real threat which has historic echoes. See, there was a great mockery in Europe when George Bush spoke about a crusade. That was dumb, wasn't very helpful language. It upset lots of Muslims and non-Muslims. But it was an accurate, conscious or unconscious, I don't know, evocation of a previous conflict, which was perfectly valid. It was not very helpful if you were trying to organize a war and have on your side moderate Muslims. It was stupid. But it did speak to a folk memory in this country and around the world. I mean, there's the famous marine songs from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. You know, the US Marines stormed ashore to fight the Barbary pirates in 1832 or whatever the hell it was. Um, sorry? Earlier. 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 Okay. 1812. 1812. I, I'm not so good before about 1850. Um, so there are, there are these memories of conflict. And, and I don't think it is fanciful that hostage taking in the Middle East evokes memories of hostage taking of another era. And I think that you. If you, when you when you come to grips with Islamophobia, if you really want to combat it, you have to accept and work with this real history and these real memories. You can't just deny them. In exactly the same way that you cannot pretend that Jews were not once in vast numbers, and where the proportion of their percentage of the population, members of the Communist Party, members of revolutionary movements. You can't deny that. I mean, one of the challenges of understanding anti-Semitism is to kind of sort out a realistic fear or aggravation felt by people in the 1920s and 30s that Jews were popping up all over the world in left-wing movements, and the fact that the vast majority of Jews were not left-wing, certainly not communists, and wanted nothing to do with these people who were not in any case speaking the name of Judaism. But there was nevertheless One is referring to uh, George W. Bush right after 9-11. The first thing he said was that this is going to be a crusade, using the term crusade. And this leads to the whole thing from way back, the view of Islam. Or I, I'm, I'm quite sure George Bush never thought of the crusades per se and, and whatever. But just using that term, the way it was viewed in the Muslim world or the Arab Muslim world or whatever, that set the tone to the whole thing that we have here in the United States is going to be set against the Muslim world. This is just one remark. Uh, the question per se is, again, you cannot talk about everything in this, and that's the role of the media here, because what I noticed primarily from the Iranian revolution, mm -hmm. a slow Demonization of Islam per se, either we like it or not. One can study that and it's clear to me. Here you have the picture of the Shah of Iran in his uniform of a general, marshal and pro-Western, etc., etc. And you have this black turban guy called Khomeini and this. And Khomeini made things worse later on with his fatwa against Salman Rushdie or whatever. And you can see what, what that did in Europe and in the West or whatever. And it seems to me, uh, you have that, and then later on, 9-11, uh, everything has made things worse, obviously. So slowly here, when you have the average Western person, uh, he may know you personally as a Muslim. It's fine, or it's not. But I can just mention Islam or Muslims. 
that's it, they are bad, they are evil, they are, they are whatever. And it seems to me here that the media play the role slowly into developing this imagery that we like to turn up, this face. I mean, when, 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 when Khomeini was there, the United States was more than happy to have Iraq beat the heck out of Iran if they could, whatever. You see, stop it right there early enough before it spreads. We did that. We failed, but we did it. I, I, I agree with you, and I think one of the most wonderful books written on this theme is by Fred Halliday. Right, I know. Kind of uh, lodestones on this, the myth of, the myth of, uh, things called the myth of confrontation. Yeah, I find it, yeah. Um, and he points out that not only is the so-called Muslim world fragmented by sect, etc., but that Muslim countries follow national interests. Some of them have been our allies of the United States and the West, some are not, um, <coughs> but were. They change uh, their allegiances according to particular geopolitical circumstances, economic circumstances, and they fight and quarrel um, amongst each other. For many, many years, uh, Iran was a great ally of the United States. Um, and, and now it's not. Uh, there was a brief moment, some of you remember, after 9-11, when the uh, leadership in Tehran condemned the, the atrocity of the attacks, and, and, and there was a great outpouring of sympathy, which was, which was squandered, wasted. <coughs> um, and, 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 and so I, I do agree, and, and, and it's been extraordinarily difficult to try and educate the media uh, about these sort of, these sort of subtleties. Um, and, and I think that that is another reason why it doesn't really help to you know, lump Jews and Muslims together and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. It, it, it provides a nice kind of shortcut for many, many reporters. And they, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, Jews, immigrants, they were poor once, yeah, they, they must all be the same. Um, it's the same kind of short-circuited thinking, and, and that's why I think this particular subject is one that Bang on about. Can I, me, I'm going to follow up a bit on this issue. Can you speak a bit about the politics of the definition of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia from the OSCE and the European Union? Because in a sense, we've done a lot of work. A lot of contemporary anti-Semitism is somewhat connected to the Middle East and extreme Israel bashing and the politics of the left, especially in Europe. Can you speak about how these definitions are constructed, why they're constructed in a certain way, why there's the collapsing, and perhaps how this fits into European Union uh, policy? Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> <No, 'cause laughs> the, the European Union, you know, after all, is the fastest growing you know, political yeah. economic entity in the world. It's expanding. Yeah. How does this fit into a global? People are running away already. Yeah. I'm with you. Great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. The. Um, uh, I, can, I can recommend some literature on this because there have been a number of articles now. One of them written by a colleague of mine, Mike Wine, uh, director of Community Security Trust in Britain, who's been involved in a number of European working groups, task forces, that have been meeting over the years to hammer out an opposite definition of anti Semitism, which is absolutely vital because there's no point Jews clamoring for European organizations to monitoring anti Semitism monitor it, combat it, if the Jews themselves cannot give them a definition of what it is they're supposed to be monitoring. There are, within Europe, between different Jewish organizations, not to mention American ones, there are huge variations in how anti-Semitism is defined and what is defined as an anti-Jewish act. Um, there is now a sort of working definition, which unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't have to have. With Islamophobia, they haven't got past, you know, the starting block yet, really. Um, and uh, is, is the combining then maybe a negation of the Holocaust in European history? No, no, it's not at all. You, no, no. You see, this is where Mac and Barnes is absolutely right. Philo-Semitism is an official policy of the European Community. I'm sorry, I know Americans don't like to hear this, but it's a fact. You, know, you cannot move without tripping over memorials to the Holocaust or hearing on the news that now every single school child is going to go be flown to Auschwitz for the day. You know, it, it, this, this is part of the civil religion of, of Europe. Partly because Jews are now the best Europeans. And the old, 
hatch those work. All those yes. So, for all of these reasons, uh, the European Union has adopted the Jews and is extremely protective of, 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 of the Jews. Uh, but that does not mean that you cannot have in place policies that are inimical to certain Jewish interests, particularly on Israel, or particularly sympathetic and protective of Muslims, which may also be inimical to Jewish interests. You can, you can think these things and do these things simultaneously with organizations as hugely ramified and bureaucratized as the EU, where you know, the left arm doesn't even know where the right arm is, let alone what it's doing. <laughs> Thing, you see. <laughs> it's very easy. You can have one policy statement coming out one day, completely contradicting a policy statement made another day, and no one will notice for several years. Um, and I think that's one reason why you get these long chains. We're against anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, xenophobia, Mormonism, atheism. So, you know, well, we're against everything. We, we, we won't unpack that and define what our policies are in case they actually do clash, but we can pass these airy resolutions and have a memorial day or a day of action and, and feel really good. That's what these intergovernmental institutions are very, very good at doing. How it plays out on ground level, well, that is another matter. And there, I think, you find very significant differences. The fact is, when I return to the UK, I will pass through immigration controls without any problem. If I had a dark skin, or if I was a woman wearing a hijab, it would not be so easy. Because the guys and the women behind those counters are told, you know, just look a bit more carefully, ask a few more questions. Mm -hmm. Jim, last question. Uh, many people think that uh, Islamophobia is the real reason that Turkey has not been admitted into the EU. Yeah. And do you think that that will only exacerbate the situation within Europe, within Europe's Muslims? Yeah. And what do you think will be the effect on Muslims within Turkey, which goes to your one of your early points about warning us about lumping all Muslims? This is really, really fascinating question, and I went to a seminar about this in Python. And if you're Israeli or pro-Israel, you really want Turkey to be in the EU. Partly because Turkey is secretly one of Israel's best friends. And secondly, if they could admit Israel, then they could admit and Cyprus. It's hard to find a good reason for keeping Israel out. So once the Judeo-Christian bastion is broken down by the admission of a, a Muslim state, well then, heck. Secular Muslims. Well, yeah. So um, much. So that's one reason why I personally think admitting Turkey into the EU is a terrifically good idea. Also because, yeah, policy, the policy of governments in Ankara vacillates. The moment there is, you know, kind of notice it that much, there is a so-called Islamist party in power. And yeah, they've, you know, they're modifying a little bit of, you know, the laws regarding wearing of the hijab. But the fact is that it is still a very strongly pro-Western state. Um, and I don't see that changing particularly for lots of reasons. I think the admission of Turkey would undercut a huge number of the arguments that young Muslims claim in different countries um, gives them grounds for feeling excluded. How can you possibly feel excluded if the EU includes uh, a Muslim country? So I think that it is terribly important also for for for. Uh, undercutting the argument of certain uh, Islamists within within uh, European countries, uh, and I think is I think Turkey actually does provide pretty much the best model for change and reform within the Muslim world, certainly within uh, the European sphere. Um, if we want Muslims to be anything. Being like Turks is probably the best thing that we could, Turkish Muslims, I should say, the best that we could aspire to. That's a note, though. Next week, Matthew Brown is coming from Paris, and we're going back to the LC building next week.